Thanks very much. As has already been explained, this is the, the second in a series of three meetings called The Pol Politics of Leninism. Um, and the aim behind these three meetings is to try and bring out what's distinctive um, and relevant today in uh, Lenin's theory and, and, and practice. Um, and last night, in the first talk of the series, I emphasised how um, the primacy of politics, in other words, the way in which all the contradictions of capitalist society are concentrated at the level of politics in the state, and it's and that has to provide the focus of any effective revolutionary practice relating to intervening in politics in order to build up the kind of movement that can overthrow the, the capitalist state. The primacy of politics, I argued, is what informs and binds together the different aspects of Lenin theory and, and practice. Um, but um, that's, that's all well and good, but it doesn't really tell us how Lenin understood the world in which he was intervening. Okay, politics uh, concentrates, fuses together all the contradictions of capitalist society, but how exactly did Lenin understand capitalist society and the, the processes of struggle that developed within it? And that's really what I want to focus on today. Now, um, yesterday um, I, I mentioned a book by a Canadian Marxist historian called Lars Lee, um, whose title I can't remember. It's called something like Lenin Retrieved or something like that. Rediscovered. Thank you. They're experts in the room. Um, and it, uh, what it brings out very well is the extent to which, for much of Lenin's political career, he didn't think of himself as in any way an innovator, but rather saw uh, himself as applying the Marxist orthodoxy of his day to specifically Russian conditions. Uh, he took as his reference point the kind of body of Marxist analysis that had been developed by the Second International, the International Socialist Movement of the day, and by the chief theorists of that movement, uh, most notably Karl Kautsky. Now, in August 1914, that stance became impossible. August 1914 is when the First World War breaks out, the first great uh, inter-imperialist war of the 20th century. The bulk of the Second International betray the cause of socialist internationalism and rally to the cause of their, their particular nation state, essentially endorse the, the, the bloody slaughter uh, inflicted by the First World War. Kautsky, who had been, as often described as the Pope of Marxism, the definer of Marxist orthodoxy, didn't actually support the war, but he essentially waffled. He, he didn't have a clear position again, against the war. And that forced Lenin to rethink the content of his Marxism to an important extent. And he does this thing that is quite remarkable. You know, the world is, is, is disintegrating. There's this appalling slaughter, slaughter go on, going on. The whole framework, in many ways, of Lenin's political life has disintegrated. What does he do? He's in exile in Geneva, and he goes into the library, and he reads Hegel. He reads Hegel's Sounds of Logic, which is, um, you know, one of the most abstruse philosophical works ever, ever written. Uh, he doesn't just read Hegel, he reads um, the work of another great uh, German thinker who was a contemporary of Hegel, the military theorist Clausewitz and so on. But Lenin, in a way, retreats, apparently retreats into theory. And his comrades in the Bolshevik party uh, went to Lenin and said, uh, please, you've gone mad, you know, get out of the library. Uh, you know, we need you and so on. Now, of course, Lenin didn't simply stay in the library. He was writing texts and intervening in the debate developing in the international socialist movement at the time. But he, you know, he, he told his comrades, I, I hope politely, to, to bugger off. You know, he was going to carry on studying in the library because he needed to rethink the many of the basic categories of Marxism that he'd relied on in that time. 
And you can see the effect of that reading, particularly of, well, particularly of Hegel and Clausewitz in different ways. They influence his subsequent thinking very, very much in the, what Lenin writes and also what he does subsequently. And some of what I um, was saying uh, last night for anyone who was there about the kind of distinctive political method that Lenin develops is indebted to the, the study of, of Hegel and Clausewitz in, in particular. But also in this period, he d undertakes a more concrete task, it, which is trying to understand what are the main contours of the capitalism of his day. The world has blown up. Capitalism has produced this appalling bloody, bloody slaughter. Why, why is it done it? What are the driving forces that have, that have produced it? And uh, Lenin reads intensively in different kinds of economic literature, and he writes a short book, which is only published after the Russian Revolution of 1917, but provides the intellectual basis of, um, uh, of, of what Lenin does in 1917. Now, that little book is called Imperialism, the Latest Stage of Capitalism. Now, I, for those long experienced in the revolutionary movement, I didn't, uh, I didn't misspeak. The title, the original title of the little book is Imperialism, the Latest Stage of Capitalism. After his death, um, it becomes renamed Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism the implication of which is that Lenin had said the last word about the whole development of capitalism. That wasn't what he was trying to do. He was under, trying to understand what made capitalism tick in his, his time and had helped to produce the imperialist slaughter. And what, crucially, he's trying to, to do is to show how the, um, the imperialist slaughter, but to be more concrete, the political driving forces that had generated the imperialist slaughter arose from deep-seated features of capitalism as it had developed in his time. And here again the contrast is with, with Kautsky. Kautsky famously, uh, just before the First World War broke out, wrote uh, an article um, uh, called Ultra-Imperialism, in which he said that capitalism had developed a stage where um, the increasingly economic power was being organised at the international level. It, it, in a way, Kautsky was anticipating the idea of globalisation. And like many ideologues of globalisation today, Kautsky reached the conclusion that um, capitalism would become so internationally integrated that war uh, would become obsolete. It wouldn't be in the interests of capitalists to go to war with each other because they'd be so closely tied together economically. Um, and that helps to explain why Kautsky just waffled about the First World War, because from his perspective, it was a mistake. Capitalists had stupidly thrown themselves into this war. One just had to hope for it to finish as quickly as possible. Whereas Lenin famously um, saw the war as an opportunity to overthrow capitalism, turn the imperialist war into a civil war. It, it, meaning a class war, uh, turn the war between nation states in a war into a war between classes. That was Lenin's political response to the outbreak of the war. But in order to ground that kind of political stance, Lenin tried to show how the tendencies to what's often called geopolitical competition, rivalries between states, arose organically from how capitalism had developed up to this stage. And this is what he tries to do in imperialism. He argues, essentially, that what you have with, the, with imperialism... Imperialism isn't crucial, actually. Lenin, did, often at that stage, people, even on the left, talked about imperialism as a policy. In other words, governments decide to use, uh, to pursue imperialist policies of colonial conquest and territorial expansion. It's just an option that they take, but they might have decided to do something completely different. Lenin understands imperialism as something much more profound. Imperialism is a stage of capitalism. It's a phase of capitalist development. It's built, in other words, into the structure of capitalism. Why is it built into the structure of capitalism? Because Lenin says, 
Imperialism is monopoly capitalism. In other words, you get a tendency for greater and greater concentration of economic power, bigger and bigger corporations, and also what he calls, following the Austrian Marxist Rudolf Hilferding, finance capital. Uh, in other words, the tendency for, the, for industry and the banks to fuse together. So you have this tremendous concentration of economic power that, that uh, takes place. And the consequence of that is that then the world becomes the stage in which these big concentrations of capitalist power, nationally organised concentrations of capitalist economic power, clash and fight for, for domination. Capitalism, in, in a certain sense, he doesn't disagree with Kautsky. He agrees with Kautsky that capitalism is bursting out of its national boundaries. Its stage is the world. The world is the stage for capitalist trade and investment. But capitalism is still nationally organised. And so that means that different, different imperialist powers fight with each other to get a bigger share of the world's markets and resources and, 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 and so on to advance their interests. So that analysis uh, helps to explain inter-imperialist war as not an accident, a mistake, an anomaly, something left over from the past, which is what Kowski <coughs> argues, um, um, but rather is something that is a direct consequence of the very structure of capitalism in its current phase. There's one other element of Lenin's theory that I just have to mention, which is that um, as I said, Lenin was prompted to develop this analysis by the, um, the way in which the international socialist movement, the Second International, disintegrated under the impact of war. So, problem, why do all these socialist parties that proclaim their internationalism rally to the cause of their own national imperialism? Lenin's explanation is what is called the theory of the labour aristocracy. And this is the idea that um, in order to widen their social base, the imperialist ruling classes use some of the extra profits, what Marx calls super profits, that they extract as a result of imperialism. They use some of those super profits to buy off a layer of the working class. So there's a, a stratum of the working class, a section of the working class that um, tends to be the best paid workers, the workers who most dominate the organised working class, who are directly benefiting from imperialism, sharing in the spoils of imperialism. And this, Lenin argues, is, is why uh, the working class movement didn't simply, as various international resolutions before 1914 had committed them to doing, um, and launch a general strike against war across the borders and so on. So there are material reasons why the working class movement doesn't rally to, to uh, the cause of internationalism. Now Lenin, much of the substance of what Lenin says isn't necessarily original. I mean, he brought together the research of a whole range of different, different writers, and he was particularly indebted to the uh, liberal economist uh, J.A. Hobson, who wrote a classic work on imperialism that I think was published in 1902, and also the work of the Marxist Hilferding, whom I've already mentioned, uh, finance capital. Um, and in some ways, a more systematic version of the theory is later, a few very shortly, no, it was really at the same time, actually, um, formulated by another Bolshevik leader, Nikolai Bukharin, in a work called Imperialism and World Economy. Um, so it's not that Lenin is staking a claim to be a leading Marxist economic theorist, although in fact Lenin understood capital very well and used capital to understand all the contradictions of Russian society. This was very important to his work as a Marxist before 1914, incidentally. But nevertheless, he's not claiming to be an original, um, that this is a greatly original work. It's more a bringing together of different lines of research politically to reorient revolutionaries in the face of the Great Imperialist War. But there are a couple of things that, that I think are uh, original to Lenin or distinctive to Lenin's approach. 
there's a very strong sense of contradiction in his work. Um, that, in other words, he, he presents imperialism as a system that is unstable and fragile because of the way in which it's riven by the contradictions internal to them. And if you compare Lenin's uh, account of imperialism with that of Bukhari, there's much less of a sense of contradiction in Bukhari. Bukhari, in, in a way, is much more elegantly written and uh, in certain ways more coherent than what Lenin says, but there's much less of a sense of the reality of contradiction in Bukhari. Secondly, and more specifically, one of Lenin's key ideas, and here he is original, or he draws something out that's in Marx and stresses it, is the idea of uneven development. In other words, uh, he argues that capitalism doesn't develop uniformly, that um, you can have the coexistence of different kinds of capitalism and different phases of capitalist development all within the same global capitalist economy. And this is a very important idea. Um, and um, it's, it's totally absent in Bukhari's version of the argument. And it's important in understanding the political conclusions that Lenin drew. So, um, um, go back to the idea of ultra-imperialism that's developed by Kautsky, this idea of a sort of globalization of capital, making war obsolete. What um, Lenin says, for that idea to work, there has to be a stable deal between the different capitalist classes. They have to be able to carve out the world according to their respective interests in a way that's going to last over a, 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 um, a substantial period of time. And he says because of uneven development, that's impossible because countries that are currently backward are going to develop, um, may be able to develop more rapidly than the established capitalist powers and that will disrupt the balance of power that formed the basis of the carve up of the world that allowed ultra imperialism in the first place. So he says, 50 years ago, Germany was a miserable backward country. Now it's the biggest industrial power in Europe and it's the rise of Germany that has disrupted the previous balance of power between the leading, leading states and therefore He's not claiming that the war is Germany's fault, but nevertheless, it's Germany's rise that through disrupting the imperialist system um, that, that produced the conditions that led to the outbreak of, break of war. And he's arguing, and he's arguing this, this isn't just a one-off case. This is something that constantly is happening uh, with, with capitalism. Apparently, backward countries can suddenly develop more rapidly uh, very rapidly, more quickly than the established powers, and overtake them and challenge them. You know, this is an analysis that, of course, um, has uh, the potential of being applied today. And we think um, of China, very poor, economically weak country, a generation ago, and the way in which it's stormy development, growing at a rate of 10% a year for more than 30 years now, although well, it's slowing down a bit now. Um, the, the way in which that's transformed the global balance of power, not just economically and politically. This is an illustration of Lenin's idea of uneven, uneven development. And from this analysis, Lenin draws conclusions for revolutionary strategy. Um, first, first of all, he says that the fact that capitalism has reached a phase where war between the leading powers is um, built into the operation of the system, or the potential for war between the leading powers is built into the system, is a sign that it's ripe for revolution. Even if some parts of the world may still be relatively economically backward and capitalism hasn't fully developed, the fact that the, the, the general level of development of capitalism has produced this, um, this very dangerous version of capitalism with this liability to huge, destructive, inter-imperialist wars. And of course, the Second World War, which Lenin didn't live to see, was destructive on an even greater scale than the, 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 first, the, the First World War. Imperialism, imperialist capitalism's liability to su such wars is a sign that capitalism has passed its sell-by date and that socialist revolution is on the agenda. Secondly, and more concretely, 
Because this is a system that involves uneven development, but uneven development within the framework of a unified imperialist system, capitalism has unified the world in the form of the in imperialism, that means different kinds of struggle confused together against imperialism. And then, you know, as I've already indicated in the theory of the labor aristocracy, Lenin is concerned with how the labor movement in the advanced countries has been corrupted, or sections of it have been corrupted by imperialism. But he has an answer to that, which is he, he believes that the, um, those sections of the working class that haven't been corrupted needs not simply to fight their own ruling classes, but to ally themselves with the revolts, the nationalist revolts, of the colonized peoples, the people who are subject to the direct political power of the different, different in, in imperialisms. I quoted last night what he said about the Easter Rising in, in, in Dublin in 1916, and he said, even though this is a petty bourgeois nationalist revolt, it's not a movement, socialist movement of the working class, we have to support it. We have to see these kinds of nationalist revolts as the allies of a working class movement fighting against capitalism. This was an enormously fertile idea and one that informed the practice of the Communist International, which was set up after the Russian Revolution, which seeks not just to unite all the revolutionary socialists of the world, but to bring the revolutionary socialists, the communists in the language of the day, the communists of the world, into alliance with the colonial peoples rising up against imperialism. And Lenin points socialists towards these colonial revolts at exactly the time when we begin to see, from the end of the First World War onwards, huge revolts in India and Egypt, the culmination of the Irish War against British rule, etc., etc. So it was a very, very fertile reorientation that Lenin offered. Okay, I'm going to have to hurry up. How relevant is this analysis to today? I think there are three weaknesses that I want to mention. Um, the, and I, I, the, the first is, Lenin doesn't really bind together his analysis of imperialism with a deep enough consideration of Marx's analysis of capitalist crises. Marx has a, um, um, the basis of an explanation of the way in which capitalism is liable to profound economic crises that happen regularly and disrupt the system and help to create the conditions for working class revolt. And this is per, per, particularly related to Marx's theory of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. In other words, capitalism is liable to a built-in tendency for the rate of return on investment, which is what capitalists are always looking for, how much profit they get relative to their in investments. Capitalism is caught up by this constant tendency of the rate of, this inherent tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Lenin doesn't really explore in a very satisfactory uh, way the relationship between the analysis of imperialism that he develops and the, the deep-seated tendencies to crisis that Marx analyzes. He says a bit about it, but to be honest, it's fairly, fairly superficial. This is a weakness, partly because once you go into Marx's theory of crisis, you see that um, capitalism often has quite a lot of room for manoeuvre in order to deal with crises. And indeed, crises uh, through removing inefficient capital um, and therefore making the system more profitable can help the system to resume its growth. So once you look more deeply into Marx's theory of crisis, you can see that there are certain periods in which capitalism has greater room for manoeuvre economically than Lenin allows. Secondly, um, as I said, he's very influenced by Rudolf Hilferding and his theory of finance capital, which is essentially about how banks dominate industry and how industrial capital is subordinated to the banks. This was very much based on how capitalism developed in Germany and to some extent in the United States in the late 19th century. It's a very fertile analysis, but it doesn't fit either Britain throughout the history of British capitalism, nor does it fit the United States since 1945. Now, since 
Britain was the dominant European <coughs> power till the early decades of the 20th century. The US, since the mid 20th century, has been the dominant imperialist power. It's a limitation of the theory that its detailed account of the structure of capitalism doesn't fit the dominant imperialist power of uh, modern capitalist history. That's, that's a weakness of the theory. It's not, it doesn't completely destroy it, but it's, it doesn't destroy it, but it's a, a limitation. Finally, the theory of the labour aristocracy is just a terrible theory. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just completely untrue. Um, it's untrue partly because you can't show how the surplus profits of imperialism reach particular sections of the working class. It's also a bad theory because if you look at who revolted against imperialism during the First World War and became the basis of the new communist movement that Lenin sought to launch internationally after the Russian Revolution, they were on the whole skilled, well-organized workers, particularly in the metal industry. In other words, a group of workers who are the best candidate for being the labor aristocracy. They were the ones who most consistently rejected imperialism from Glasgow and Sheffield through Turin, Berlin, right to, to, uh, to, to Petrograd. The theory, I mean, it's necessary to have an explanation of why right-wing politics can dominate the working class movement. The theory of the labor aristocracy is a really bad way of doing it. What, what's a better theory? If you want to find out, ask me any question. Um, but the fundamental insight that Lenin offers that um, a mature, globalized capitalism of the kind that was already well established at the beginning of the 20th century is incapable of achieving geopolitical instability, that it's constantly fractured and destabilized by potentially profoundly destructive conflicts, as is illustrated by the two, two world wars. That basic insight remains fundamentally valid. Lenin's critique of the idea of ultra-imperialism, his critique of the idea that a globalized capitalism produces peace between the powers, remains absolutely relevant today. Um, slight um, Slight um, uh, bit of self-publicity. Um, me and that, that uh, my book, Imperialism and Global Political Economy, but also uh, earlier, David Harvey, in his book, The New Imperialism, we both tried to restate Lenin, Lenin's theory of imperialism in terms that avoid the, the, the limitations of Lenin's theory, in particular through the idea that imperialism involves an intersection of economic competition, the economic rivalries between firms, and geopolitical competition, the rivalries between, between states. And that's an attempt to, to um, reaffirm, or certainly in my case, I think it's less clear in David's case, uh, but certainly in my case, that's an, effect, an attempt to restate the core of that theory in a way which fits, fits the, the contemporary world. The other thing that I think is tremendously fertile in Lenin's ideas is the, interact, the idea of the interaction between uh, revolts against imperialism um, in, outside the so-called core of the system and the development of a revolutionary workers' movement where the main centres of capitalism are. The idea that these, these two movements can cross-fertilise interact, support each other, strengthen each other, I think that's absolutely, absolutely valid, valid today. Um, if we look at the way in which the, the movement against neoliberal capitalism, the so-called anti-globalization movement, developed into an anti-war movement, responding to the, um, the American and British invasion of Iraq, is an illustration of that. But I think much more dramatic is what's what's happened with the, with the Arab revolution. Here we have um, the rebellion of the masses in countries dominated by imperialism, in Egypt in a way that reflected the strategic importance of the country from the point of view of US imperialism, with very tight ties, particularly between the Egyptian military and the Pentagon and the CIA, all the rest of them. Here you have a rising that has democratic demands, that has 
a national content in the sense of beginning to challenge American domination in the alliance with Israel, but in which there's also an element of workers' revolt. And then that offers a model for fighting against capitalism in the rest of the world. Tahrir Square is imitated in the Spanish state, in Greece, and of course with the Occupy movement from Wall Street to just about like everywhere else. They, the, 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 the fact that you could have a movement emerging from the so-called periphery that offers a model for anti-capitalist struggles in the center. In lots of ways, that would have been Lenin's dream fulfilled. Hello, I'm Dominic Knuckle, and I'm going to thank Alex for a fascinating talk on imperialism. I'd just like to address a quick comment to people in the room who are trying to get to the Higgs boson talk. There's a nice quick question, do, should Marxists care? I think the answer is actually no. And the reason why is actually to do with imperialism, because kind of, actually when you look at um, modern scientific research, why, why is all this focus on the Higgs boson? It's about, actually it's competition between the European states and the, and the Americans. Is why these two research groups are putting loads of money into this research. It's a way of um, kind of having competition between between different imperialist states without actually resorting to arms. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin. I'm from Colorado in the States. And uh, thanks also for the talk. And I just had a question um, about, like, you were focusing on the internationalism of Lenin's, um, like, specifically how it's uh, focusing on the internationalism of Lenin's. Uh, theory and allying with, even with like nationalist groups and how you think that just where where that went wrong I guess like in the development of you know the Soviet Union to the point that like would you say that the Soviet Union was just you know I mean just an imperialist power in the exact same way as Lenin was criticizing or, or is there something kind of different going on? And I guess like specifically in terms of entrenching like build, building socialism in one state. Like it seems to me like that's kind of a kind of key moment where something important is lost in you know, the state in that whole kind of uh, theory. So, Hi, uh, my name is Laura. Um, I, I want to uh, well, 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 like ask you to talk about this about the uh, workers' aristocracy because uh, I find that it's um, very confusing sometimes because at board meetings in in, in my union uh, I'm, I'm the only one who votes against uh, buying stocks that have these enormous profits we make but the union makes a lot of money and uh, I'm, I'm wondering is that a part of the uh, because I find it very hard to argue against these people uh, in board meetings uh, because well the money goes to the union but uh, I think the perspective is just a, a simple question. Does uh, Rosa Luxemburg's work on accumulation of capital, which I think was 1913, um, does address the issue of the export of capital in, in the imperial mode and the drive to, to colonise? Is that completely um, kind of faulty? Um, I know that Joe Robinson at um, in mid-century, last century, was very interested in, and she writes forward to, um, uh, and obviously this important Mar Marxian, I think she would have said, economist. So I, I just wonder if, if A, did Rosa Luxemburg influence um, Lenin, and she was in dialogue with Hilferding, um, or B, um, does she have a contribution and something to make to this today? Uh, yes, I spoke about Kelsey's rather fuddled ideas of um, imperialism as it was at the turn of the 20th century. And compared to some modern day thinkers, I think Alex will have in mind, particularly and specifically, Francis Fakuama and the end of ideology and his jumble ideas that, you know, we're all peaceful now, blah, blah. And then, later on in the speech that um, Alex would give 
in. He talks about the alignment of different nations and the different regions that come together to unite and revolt, to unite and revolt. Recently, there were some brilliant rights up and down the country to destruction much properly and the destruction and punishment of many problems. Why didn't the revolutionary British left wing come together with those young people to revolt? Hi, my name's Joe, I'm a teacher. Um, I, I mean, a couple of things really. Just uh, on the, the issue of kind of, um, you know, Katsky and the idea of um, ultra imperialism, I mean, I thought, I thought perhaps what he was arguing, or at least uh, a, a more modern version of it, is, is just the fact that it's, um, it's not necessarily all wars will end as such, or all conflicts will end, but more than just large scale inter imperialist wars will end. And, um, you know, I wonder if, if perhaps there isn't, I mean, there isn't something different about the sort of imperialism we've got now in terms of whether this is a kind of imperialist, uh, you know, directly, America directly trying to compete with China and other countries when it goes around kind of invading Iraq and things like that. Because I'm not sure it is entirely, and I think there's, there's, there's some element of Kowski's idea of a kind of global peace for capital global system of capital, all global, uh, global multinational companies. So it kind of makes a certain amount of sense. Um, so I just wonder what you've got about that. And the second thing is just some, just with the problems of, uh, some of the problems involved in um, the idea of supporting nationalist uprising. So you, you've kind of highlighted the Egypt situation as kind of an absolute model, which in some ways it is. But then of course, it politically, um, in terms of the votes in the presidential election, they elect someone who is, um, you know, an Islamist candidate, and, and I wonder what kind of relationship you feel that has with the, the nationalism. It's not quite as straightforward as a secular nationalist struggling against imperialism when you have quite, sorry, quite negative uh, forces, that, Islamist forces, say, with Hamas in, in Palestine or all the Egypt situation as well. I wanted to say something about the um, project. If, um, <coughs> um, I just wanted to come back on the question or develop the question about um, the Socialism in One Country project, um, which was came about a Stalinist project as an alternative to what Trotsky said for which was International Socialist Revolution, which was something which um, Stalin was able to develop as the project after the defeat of um, the Russian Revolution uh, by 1926, when Stalin was in power following 19 imperialist Stalin's having invaded Russia in order to defeat that revolution, which enabled Stalin to come to power. And so the project being to spread that revolution as was necessary. Um, it became the project of building socialism, so called in one country, which um, effectively developed what came to be known as state capitalism in competition with Western capitalism. The same dynamic as capitalism, um, ruling class at the top, exploiting the majority of the population. Um, um, you yeah, know, state capitalism. So, um, and that started the development of the, the division of the world into you know, Eastern Bloc and Western Bloc countries where the ruling class of Russia sought um, alliance with ruling classes in other countries. Um, and it was, um, yeah, and the guy asked the question that something was lost. Yes, something was lost. Uh, just a question, really. Um, I read in the Observer recently that the Americans were getting worried about Chinese activities in the Caribbean. Um, and it's just about whether there's any, any about the nature of modern imperialism, is it different? And they're calling it the um, Caribbean libraries crisis, because China was building libraries or schools in, in the Caribbean. So it's just a question about the nature of modern imperialism, is there anything different? And I just also wondered about the, um, the computer, you know, the, the idea that the USA are, are trying to destroy the Iranian to computer programming, to hacking into their computers. Yeah, um, uh, two points. I want 
thing is about uh, Alex talked about uh, how uh, you know when small weak powers uh, grow and and disturb the the, uh, the imperial balance. Of, uh, I, I, I think today we are not talk, just talking about China as a small and weak power growing. We are also talking about a long time decline of the most important uh, imperialist power since uh, yeah maybe the thirties or definitely after World War Two. Uh, and on top of that, a, 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 a capitalist crisis of accumulation. So so what we have is. Uh, uh, you know, uh, several bombs in the system that uh, that are, explode, are, are exploding and threatening the, the balance. Uh, 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 but really, my my key thing is, is to, to say that I mean to draw a link to the the the, um, the, the, the political situation in which Lenin wrote in Pierre because what we saw was a collapse of uh, of a very strong workers' movement. You know, talking about. Uh, millions of workers uh, seeing the Second International as this is the world uh, workers' movement. Uh, uh, having, you know, uh, said on several international congresses, uh, we will uh, fight against this war, and if it comes, we'll, we'll, we'll organize a general strike. And, and the scale of that collapse is, I, I think, the uh, uh, underlines uh, the, what, what Alex talked about in the first. Uh, part of this series, uh, the friendship uh, of, 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 of politics. This was not just understanding why the war happened. happened. This was also, uh, first of all, uh, in my mind, a tool to actually try to shape uh, a force to uh, to fight back against this war and to actually, uh, and because if you couldn't do that, then talking about a revolution is, I mean, that's uh, just uh, uh, mind work only. So, so, so in that sense, uh, in that sense. Uh, I think that you can definitely say that uh, that uh, for them it, it, it was uh, uh, it was a block in the road he had to he had to uh, to overcome in order to actually uh, pose a, an alternative uh, to to the collapse of, of of the Second International and and rebuilding a revolutionary uh, workers movement. So in that sense, I think yes, we can get uh, quite preoccupied with the technicalities of it, and I, I urge people to do that as well, but, but definitely uh, understanding it in the framework of, of, of a much more serious uh, uh, political challenge for, uh, for, for actually uh, developing a revolutionary movement. Yeah, I have a question about how we can use the, the theory of imperialism of Lenin to, to, um, to analyze uh, the current uh, situation, because um, I, I think a parallel with the unequal defined development uh, uh, element uh, of uh, Lenin's uh, theory is uh, the role of Russia. That um, and you, you, you can see this in the war uh, with uh, Georgia, uh, the, the, the more aggressiveness of uh, Russia. And I think um, it also had to do something with. Uh, lack of strong movements from below that could uh, resist these uh, drives of war. Uh, and, and I think the opposite uh, we can see in the Arab revolutions uh, that, uh, and also the uh, international resistance against the Iraq war um, that was also uh, uh, combined with uh, the incredible uh, courageous uh, resistance in the Iraq itself against the war that prevents this internal drive towards uh, war because there is, uh, of course, a competition in the Middle East going between uh, the United States, Russia, uh, Europe. Um, it, 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 it doesn't seem to be alive, but that's because of, I think, the, the revolutionary movements in the Middle East. Yeah, I just want to come back uh, briefly on the labour aristocracy um, theory that, uh, that uh, Alex referred to. I mean, if you think of the logic of it, if it was our position today, any union negotiator would, would, would go in to meet the bosses and go, I've just had a meeting with my members, and they're really, really unhappy. They're really, they've come in here, they're absolutely pissed off. They've seen, they've seen through all your tricks, they know they're being bribed, and they demand wage cut immediately, right, full with. Because 
Um, you know, because uh, that's, that's the, um, the, the logic of what the Labour democracy leads to, that somehow it is a bribe. It's not a bribe at all. It's come from um, class struggle. They were the most organised groups. You know, the boss is up and suddenly gives money away. Um, yeah, it's come because they're organised, and it's because they were organised, as Alex said, it was these people who led uh, the revolt in Berlin and other places that brought down the Kaiser. They, in the time when it was still hard to keep trade union organisation organization together, they were the ones that kept it going, and that's why they were the best placed ones to, to do what they did in, in, in 1918. I mean, 
mean, I support our um, old buildings and what's on the outside, the on the outside there before. Um, I support our national struggles, for example, the Palestinian movement. Um, do we support um, those sort of struggles and then base, there's no you know, guarantee that those struggles will turn into socialism at the end of it? Um, so, building up on sort of Lenin's idea of supporting these struggles, um, as you mentioned know, before, the bourgeois um, revolution before and um, other anti imperialist struggles. Um, what would our sort of be the angle and perception and our support of um, places like Cuba, for example, as some people might say it's an anti against anti imperialism, um, based on what you see the perception of Cuba and the relation with Lenin as well in that? But yeah, that's good. As a retired teacher, I've got time to go and listen at Occupy events. I've got time to listen to my neighbours railing against the benches. I've got time to get involved in middle-class protest groups against the local council. What I learned from Lenin is you go to the library in Zurich and you read and theorise and then you come back again. Those people in the Occupy, they, they call it anti-capitalism because they are scared shitless of using the word socialism. They do not understand what socialism is. They've been told that unions are a bad thing and you just have to watch American movies and you know they're riddled with the mafia and you shouldn't touch them. They are so ignorant. But once you've got your theory ready and you have listened to them, you can start speaking to them. The collapse of the Second International in some ways is the same sort of challenge we faced on the left in Britain now with, in one sense, the collapse of any left-wing understanding of the world. We're held up to mockery by a lot of people, but if we can listen to them, we can then give them the tools to help articulate their real rage, and you can then start a movement that will change things. And we, we call this talk anti-capitalism. Why do we not call it socialism in an age of horrible class war by a, a ruling class? And, and now, they don't like to say that in those events. We've got to shift the discourse that way. represent a means by which employers and capitalist class more generally are attempting to buy the allegiance of workers. Because, uh, I want to tell you, because shares and in, in many ways all performance related benefits now fall into this category. And they are clearly an attempt by employers to buy the allegiance and loyalty of workers and to act against unions and to suggest that employers and employees are really all in it together. You know, that the future of the firm, the success of the firm, ties us all, to, all together. That is clearly their idea. Do they work? Well, certainly, sometimes in the short term, but they can act as a wind of undermining the union, and many unions have seen that danger and have acted against it. But certainly in the long term, there's not very much evidence that they do work. Take, for example, Royal Mail, which has an enormous company scheme called Colleague Share. Colleague Share is supposed to bind Royal Mail workers to the success of the company by setting performance related uh, uh, points, which if that performance is met, then Colleague Share is paid and Royal Mail workers get uh, an increase in their pay. Now that's supposed to buy loyalty and social peace. Instead what it's done has over successive years been the main source of eruptions of enormous anger inside Royal Mail and the reason why people end up fighting because the bosses constantly try and raise the, uh, the, the performance points at which this bonus is paid to such unmeetable uh, areas that it results in major strikes and so in, in many ways what they try and do to try and alleviate tension and to try and create social peace becomes the exact opposite and sparks whole industrial disputes. And so I think for comrades who are facing it and maybe feeling slightly downcast at this moment while people around me seem to be voting for this stuff, 
I think you have to play a slightly longer game. It may be the case that the employers can offer this kind of bonus for now, but as capitalism increasingly finds itself in crisis, can they afford to keep paying, giving us socks in order to try and keep us happy? Will they try and use those socks as a means to try and attack us? Almost certainly that will be the case. Thank you. I suspect we all like the sound of our own voices. Uh, um, first of all, someone said, uh, complained about the title of this meeting. I don't think he got it right. This is a meeting on imperialism and resolution, which I don't think is a particularly compromising title to anyone. Uh, I can't deal with, there are so many questions, I can't deal with all of them, and some have thankfully been addressed by uh, other people contributing to the discussion. Just quick, quickly on the Rosa Luxemburg. Rosa Luxemburg was a very great revolutionary um, who then respected a, a great deal. The accumulation of capital, however, has a deeply flawed analysis because she misunderstands. It's, it's quite, the detail is technical, but she misunderstands um, some of uh, basic elements of Marx's approach in capital, and that's the basis of her own, her misunderstanding of Marx is then the basis of her own explanation of, of imperialism. So it doesn't work. Nevertheless, she has a very good, in the later chapters of the accumulation of capital, a very good description of the barbarous ways in which imperialism was breaking into the rest of the world and dominating it and the suffering it was causing and so on and so, so forth. So the accumulation of capital is a flawed work. I'd rather have Rosa Luxemburg than the section of the contemporary German left who thinks that the theory of imperialism is, is obsolete. You know, wake up and smell the coffee. Look what's, look what's happening in, in the world. Look at the tremendous poverty and degradation that is caused by the contemporary economic system on a global scale. Look at, um, look at the, um, the occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan. And even though the US has retreated from Iraq and is in the process of re retreating from Afghanistan, don't think that the effort of the United States to maintain its global domination by force is going to stop. You know, predator drones, special forces, the whole apparatus of uh, murder and coercion is being maintained and, re and, and reinforced. I have to say, I think the section of the German left who uh, reject the theory of imperialism, on the whole of people who don't like to confront the fact that, it, that at the sharp end of imperialism these days are people of Muslim faith. And that's what I'm going to come back to in a, in, a, in a bit. I mean, I think it's ridiculous to think that we don't live in a world dominated by imperialism. Now, in terms of the question of, you know, have we moved away from an era of inter-imperialist inter wars, what happens in the second half of the 20th century is that you have competition between two big imperialist blocs, the US and its allies, the Soviet Union and their, their allies, um, and that um, contains the tendencies to inter-imperialist competition in two ways. First of all, that the US successfully subordinates all the other advanced capitalist countries to its political and ideological leadership through NATO, through the US alliance with Japan, etc., etc. And that means that within the Western bloc, you have economic competition, but you don't have that translating into geopolitical rivalries, the way in which um, economic competition tended to in the late 19th and early, early 20th centuries. And to a significant extent, the US has been able to maintain that separation of economic and geopolitical competition. The, the reason why, I mean, I think it's important to emphasize that um, the world came very close to thermonuclear war between East and West twice. The w one case is the one we all know about, the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962. But in, uh, a bit over 20 years later, in, I think it was October 1983, the, the Russians nearly launched a strike against the US because they thought, misinterpreted things the Americans were doing and thought the Americans were preparing a preemptive strike against them. 
and it didn't happen. But now that the records are all being opened, it's clear the work, you know, that the, 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 the winter of 1983 was an extremely dangerous moment in world history. So it's a bit dangerous to say, oh, nuclear war didn't happen, uh, and therefore inter-imperialist war um, is, is, uh, is, is all the agenda. The more fundamental reason why there wasn't a war between the US and the USSR was that, to put it in the jargon of international relations theory, they were both satisfied powers. You know, they carved the world up between them at the end of the, 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 um, of the, the Cold War. Oh, sorry, at the end of the Second World War, they were largely happy with what they got. The Americans wanted to, you know, incorporate the Russians, but they'd done pretty well. They weren't so worried about it that they wanted to launch a war to get Eastern and Central Europe. And of course, in a sense, they did get it peacefully in the end. I think now we're in a way a potentially more dangerous situation. See, what happens at the beginning of the 20th century is Britain, the dominant imperialist power, is faced with Germany which challenges Britain's industrial supremacy, but also builds a navy that threatens Britain's naval predominance, because it was the navy that was the crucial way in which British imperialism projected power and protected its global, global empire. And as I said, within Western capitalism in the second part of the 20th century, you have this separation of economic and geopolitical competition. But where are we now? Where are we now? The US, the dominant imperialist power in the world, is faced with China, who is challenging its industrial supremacy. China now produces more manufactured goods than the US does. And secondly, China is also building a navy, which is a challenge to the US's predominance in the Pacific since the end of the Second World War. Now, it's very, very stupid to say, because the same pattern that developed at the beginning of the 20th century is recurring now that therefore there'll be a third imperialist war and we'll all die in a nuclear hor holocaust or anything uh, horrible like that. But nevertheless, the, the kind of dynamic of economic and geopolitical competition, which is called Lenin's theory of imperialism, is still at still work. Okay, very quickly on a couple of other things. Comrade explained very well that um, what, in the case of the development of the Soviet Union you have is the triumph of nationalism over international socialism with socialism more in one country and essentially the development in the USSR on the ruins of the workers' councils of the Soviets, um, a new capitalist power, state capitalist power, seeking to rival the Western imperialist powers. That's fundamentally different from what Lenin was talking about. When he talked about an alliance between revolutionary workers in the advanced capitalist countries and nationalist rebels in the, in the colonies, he was talking about an international alliance that would break the global structure of imperialism. So it was nothing about fragmenting the world into rival national capitals. It was about um, stoking the fires of revolt to destroy the whole imperialist system. Now, some, a couple of people asked, how do Islamists fit, fit, fit in with all this? Well, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, the Communist International had absolutely no problem about allying with people of Muslim faith. One of the major enemies of the new revolutionary um, uh, workers' republic in, in Russia was the British Empire. The British Empire dominated people of Muslim faith in, on the, in the Indian subcontinent, but also in the Middle East, which the Britain and France had just gobbled up. And the Bolsheviks were very clear. They saw nationalist revolts against British imperial domination as their ally, even if the um, leadership of those nationalist re revolts were you know, primitive versions of what we call Islamism. There was a Congress organized by the uh, Communist International in Baku, uh, which is the capital of Azerbaijan, now an independent state, in 1920, the Congress of the Peoples, where that alliance between the Communist International and nationalist rebellions, including Muslim rebellions, very important, Baku is in Central Asia, where most people are Muslim, Muslim faith. The um, people who get, and this goes back to those German, so, leftists who reject Lenin's theory of imperialism.
people who uh, get fixated on a particular faith and the fact that that particular faith can provide an ideological justification for people coming into at least partial rebellion against the system are capitulating to the dominant, dominant ideology. If you look, uh, it's like getting fixated with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, but they portray it as this monolith, this evil Islamist monolith that is going to you know, swallow up everything that's good in Egyptian society. In fact, the Muslim Brotherhood is a formation that's tremendously unstable, riven by social contradictions because of the great swathe of different kinds of social forces that it embraces. Its leadership vacillates and manoeuvres and uh, trem tremendously. A determined revolutionary approach, which says we want to see a workers' revolution in Egypt, but to achieve that workers' revolution, many of the people who now support the Muslim Brotherhood are going to have to be won to the revolutionary cause, and that therefore we must look at ways of fighting side by side with people who look towards the Brotherhood. That kind of approach is critical to the success of revolution in countries like e Egypt. And, in, and rather than that in any way contradicting what Lenin says, it's very close to the, the, the very nub, the very heart of Lenin's theory and practice, as I tried to bring out particularly yesterday.